Ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake, artificial intelligence is changing the movie industry. The real question is, to what extent? While filmmakers inevitably have to turn to AI, not only for marketing purposes, but also for early stage content development. Meanwhile, we all know that Netflix and Amazon are credited with driving the AI revolution, but as their algorithms are closely guarded secrets, what does that mean for the rest of us? And to quote a colleague at The Guardian, does the use of AI signal a brave new world or is it the death knell of creativity? These are but some of the questions that we'll be addressing in today's usage of AI in European movies EFM workshop as we break down the experience of 22 European producers who applied AI tools to their projects. Welcome. My name is Ana Maria Montero and it is my pleasure to be your host today. And even though I can't actually see you, of course, it's great to know that you're out there. At last count, I think there was about a thousand of you registered. So I'm looking forward to one hell of a Q&A session. Speaking of which, if you do have a question, feel free to submit it via the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Now, we will either answer these directly in the moment or during the Q&A session at the end of the program. And the session, of course, for your information is being recorded. Now, as I mentioned earlier, 22 producers from nine European countries used AI tools for the development of their films over the course of six months. They were all part of an initiative spearheaded by Lausanne-based company Largo, with the support of the Swiss Ministry of Culture and Media Desk Suisse, with the goal of introducing AI tools to the European movie industry. So how did it go? Well, to help answer this question, I'd like to introduce Sami Arba. He is CEO and founder of Largo. Sami, it's so good to see you. Thank you. It's good to see you as well. Now, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the results of the workshop. But first, you have a PhD in computer science from EPFL, as well as a background in film, having directed and produced two shorts and creating a film festival in Switzerland. At what point did you decide to say, okay, now it's time to mesh these two passions together and uh, provide AI support to the film industry? Yeah, well, filmmaking has been always a passion uh, for me and computer science has been my profession. But even in computer science, I have always worked in the interdisciplinary topics. Like my PhD uh, studies have been on computational aesthetics. So I was always having a plan to bring some, the, some of the technology we use in computer science to the movie industry at the end of the, uh, my PhD. And that's, that has been the start of Largo. And as I mentioned earlier, Largo is behind this initiative of bringing uh, these 22 producers together and collecting the results of their AI experience. Now, I know that in just a minute, you're going to break down the good, the bad, and the ugly for us and tell us how everything went. But if you can just give me the headline, what is it that prompted you to say, okay, now I want to do the, La the Largo AI workshop? Yeah, I mean, uh, so with this media desk initiative, uh, we want to bring Largo AI technologies more to European producers as well. Uh, and we had really this intensive uh, period of six months together with these uh, producers. We had a lot of... Uh, results on their interaction with AI, and we want to share the, these results uh, to, uh, to other people in the industry, as many people are curious about the practical usage of AI today. But at the same time, many of them don't have uh, any idea about those. I mean, what really AI does, is it really taking away the creativity, or is it really an assistance tool? Uh, so it's also good to, to share all this experience uh, with, with everybody in the industry to have a, a bit of more opinion on this. All right. So without further ado, let's hear it. Sammy, the floor is yours. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> so I will have a presentation for that. I will share my screen. Uh, okay, great. So I assume my presentation is visible to everybody. Uh, so before going forward with the presentation, I want to thank uh, Swiss Ministry of Culture and Media Desk Swiss for supporting this initiative that uh, we have onboarded 22 European producers for a six month period to use uh, these AI tools. And I want to thank also uh, Swiss Films and Eric Pom Institute for helping us to organize this workshop. 
Uh, and in the program, as uh, uh, Anna Maria mentioned, we had 22 European producers from nine different countries. Uh, and they had six months, uh, six months of access to, uh, to the AI tools of Largo AI. It started in August 2020, and then the program has uh, ended at the end of uh, January 2021. And in total, 80 movies have been uh, put into the system by the producers uh, uh, in the program. And out of 80, 43 films uh, were in pre-production uh, and six movies were on post-production and the rest uh, were in distribution phase. And they performed uh, 216 analysis over these projects. To define what is an analysis, so basically on Largo AI platform, you add your project in development, but then you can run an analysis by putting a different version of your content, script uh, or video version, together with, uh, uh, with overall packaging. So you have a script version and then some packaging like specific cast, director, budget, et cetera. Uh, and then you run an AI analysis on that. If you change that, and then you run a new analysis to see a different scenario for, for, for your film. And uh, so, and from an analysis, uh, what you get uh, is, uh, uh, is multi-level. So let me give you a bit background about the technology and what you are getting uh, in a nutshell uh, for, for uh, as uh, analysis results. Here you see an example from Little Woman movie. Uh, the system takes the content of this film. It can be script or video. And then it creates a main ingredients of this film uh, with, with our neural network system. Here in the middle, you see this genre patterns and age suitability patterns that are automatically uh, created by the AI. For example, in genre patterns, you see the pink uh, color represents romance and it shows how the romance is changing over the content from start till the end of the film. And it also creates a DNA of the content with certain cinematographic attributes. You see this on the right side. And we have three main titles of the results. Uh, so the first thing you get is content insights. And then AI uh, uh, is using these insights also to provide the character analysis and casting propositions. Uh, and finally, we have a uh, market forecast again, uh, which is uh, providing some uh, box office streaming uh, forecasting for, uh, uh, for the movies. And here yeah, in this presentation, we will show some results from the movies within this program uh, in an anonymous uh, way. So we won't tell the titles, but we will show some general results. And starting with uh, genre analysis, here you see uh, like uh, examples from six films within the program. Uh, and you, you can see from these patterns, there is a quite a bit of variation. For example, this film, uh, this, this pattern on the highlight uh, that you see on the left, uh, you see there's more adventure action patterns uh, in the content. You can also see a more uh, Hollywood type of structure. Uh, these up and downs, it gives some idea about the plot points of the film, and we have some dominant uh, plot points in this uh, in this film. Or we have here, you see the film on the highlight, uh, a film with more sci-fi themes, or uh, the film on the right bottom that you see, we have uh, this brown color indicates the horror theme. We have a film with, with the horror themes, and you see also high frequency details uh, once uh, you look the dynamic change over the content, which is... Uh, uh, apparent in many cases in, in actually horror movies. Uh, and then if you look at overall representation of these dominant genres, it might give us an idea also about uh, European uh, movie industry. Uh, so what we did here for these statistics, we found top three genres that are found by AI for each uh, content. So if drama is appearing at top three genres, we call it call this as dominant genre. So in those films, 95% uh, cases, drama was a dominant uh, genre, thriller 59% cases, and comedy 46% uh, cases, it was a dominant genre. And uh, while the producers, uh, producers are adding their projects onto the platform, we also ask uh, several information uh, to see their perception of the project. For example, they put, uh, the genre, their understanding of genre for the film. And we have seen in these uh, 80 movies, AI uh, 
uh, have agreed with their selections in 80% cases for dominant genres. And it was disagreeing for 20% cases. Uh, and the story was a bit different once we look at the age suitability analysis. Uh, in age suitability analysis, as I showed in this little woman example, the system automatically finds how is the suitability of the content for different age groups is uh, changing from start till the end. And then it finds like the dominant suitability, dominant uh, interest groups. And here we have three groups, adults, all audiences and uh, teenager plus adults. And at 60% cases, AI didn't agree with what producers were having as a perception of their content. And I would like to tell here, in most of cases, uh, the producers selected all audiences as, as like a, as suitability uh, for their content. So I can see the point here because yeah, uh, it is normal that to target all audiences for, for many producers. Uh, as uh, it brings certain advantages, perhaps for financing and marketing. But once we look at the reality, only uh, a limited part of the people getting both the label of all audiences from the institutions, and also only limited films can be addressed actually in reality to all audiences. So here we uh, would, look, would like to emphasize the, the results were the distribution of results that were found by AI was quite aligned actually what is happening uh, with the, in the industry in the past. Okay, so I am moving from content insights to casting uh, analysis uh, results. Uh, so let me give you a quick overview of how the AI uh, provides uh, uh, the casting analysis. So once the content is added, it creates a DNA of the content, DNA of the characters. As, and same way it has uh, created the DNA of the actors by analyzing their previous films. And then it can make some, uh, some automatical suggestions uh, to see which character is actually matching uh, which, uh, uh, which actors. Uh, and here one, uh, one, thing, one challenge actually we saw in this program uh, especially uh, was the ethnicity uh, blindness of AI. So we, on purpose, we, we designed our AI to be ethnicity uh, blind. And this has been challenged by several producers because sometimes, for example, you have uh, like a white uh, char a character that you want to be white, but the AI is proposing a black actor because it doesn't look ethnicity. It looks your budget, your, the age of the character, the gender, active country, language, and how much the content is matching with the actor, but not ethnicity. Uh, so this has been a, a dilemma for us, actually, uh, because if you put ethnicity information into AI, the main uh, thing, uh, it will also learn about the bias of the industry in terms of the diversity. So it will repeat the same bias uh, as industry is doing. Uh, but at the same time, we can see also the, the importance of that in practical usage. So since yeah, this is a general question for us as well, we want to ask this to you uh, too. We, we have a poll uh, in that. So I will just start this poll and it's good to get the opinion of the people as we have many people from the industry today. Uh, so you should see a poll uh, in front of your screen just about that. Yeah, please uh, go and make your vote. Uh, so we have, we put two fourth choice, actually, it can be like some third choice as well, an intermediate choice, but it's good to see if we have left only with these two options, uh, what the overall industry is thinking about that actually. I see really quite high participation already. We have 200 participations. There is one of the, choice is dominating at this moment, but I think let's wait a bit more. Maybe that might change with the participation of more people. Sixty percent voted uh, so far. I, we can wait maybe a few seconds more. Yeah, I think we have converged to a points, so I see there are more votes, but I think I can stop at this point. I think uh, 
and share the results with you. And yeah, we, I think, yeah, we don't have a clear winner, but we see the majority of people still prefers that AI shouldn't uh, learn uh, the casting bias by putting the ethnicity information to AI. Uh, well, a practical solution to that, I mean, if it, ethnicity becomes really important for a character, uh, we tell normally the producers to put their short list of actors because uh, still, if you put your shortlist, AI again creates the risk analysis uh, uh, for these specific actors. Okay, I will move forward. Uh, thank you very much for participating in that poll. And some practical info uh, information in relation uh, with uh, this, uh, this uh, program, uh, with these eight movies in this program uh, for actors as aspects. Uh, so he, here you see the, these images of some actors. These are uh, some of most proposed actors by AI. Uh, so AI proposed uh, these actors as a potential cast uh, uh, for different projects. But one thing to note that here, in total for 80 projects, it proposed 1,000 different actors. So normally for each character, it proposes five actors. And in total, uh, having 1,000 actors for 80 movies, actually it shows that it didn't have a cluster of actors that it focused and it repeatedly uh, proposed uh, as a potential actor. We think this is very important because one concern about AI always is that if it repeats the certain things, certain recipes, uh, the certain actors, directors, in that regard, I think uh, all, this is also a good indication. It provides us also opportunities to see some maybe hidden talents, some, uh, some uh, people in the corner, maybe that you wouldn't uh, recognize easily, but then AI brings this on your table that this uh, puts as an option uh, for you uh, to, to consider for your project. Okay, so then I finally move uh, the financial forecast part. As I mentioned, we have three main type of the analysis. I don't give all details, but uh, the, the analysis related to the content, the casting, and, and then financial uh, forecast, market forecast. In this, uh, so normally we provide now the box office predictions and streaming pred predictions. In this uh, program, we only had uh, the box office predictions available at that time. And the system automatically uh, predicts uh, a most expected revenue for the country that you release. And it also provides the, uh, the risk intervals uh, for the film. And let's look at the forecast that has been done for the films that has been in the system. Because of the COVID, we were not able to see the uh, we were not able to see the results of uh, this forecast as the most of the movies have not been released in this period. But we have uh, some interesting results for this part. Uh, so here you see return on investment calculations according to AI forecasts. Uh, so we made a, a simple uh, return on investment calculation, basically what we did just dividing the revenue with the budget. So in, you see the numbers on the vertical line. Uh, so it shows the multiplier uh, of the uh, budgets in terms of revenue. And the blue lines, they are showing the domestic uh, forecast and gross ones are indicated with the orange color. Uh, and you can see only few films actually by AI has uh, by AI seen as to go over the domestic or to go over the budget uh, uh, budget amount. But if you look at the gross potentials, at this one third of the films, uh, uh, they are showing good potential. And this actually shows again the importance of the co-productions in uh, European films. Because for the domestics, the main challenge, uh, the first challenge comes with the population of the countries. Many of projects here, they, they have the main release country as like Austria, Switzerland, Belgium. So they are already limited uh, with the population. So they cannot go too close uh, to budget easily. But there are also some other reasons uh, to be a bit lower uh, in domestic in terms of return on investments. And one of them is uh, PNA that we have observed uh, in these uh, movies. 
The average budget of the projects in this program was 5 million uh, euro. Uh, but the, it can look a bit hot, too high for you, but uh, the median is lower than that. So it means actually the majority of the projects had a budget lower than 5 million. Uh, the same thing for uh, for PNA. So PNA uh, marketing budget uh, has been indicated as 0 0.9 million uh, euros, but they, again the majority has been uh, below that. Uh, one thing yeah, we see, I mean, in many cases, uh, yeah, the PNA has been like one tenth even lower of the budget, which has been also uh, one reason for lower return on investment. I will show you in in a few slides. Uh, and before going to that, I want to show you. Uh, some improvements that, that the producers have achieved uh, by using the tools. In their first analysis, in average, the domestic return was around, uh, the domestic return on investment was around 0 0.24, and that has increased in their best analysis case. case. So what does it mean, best analysis case? Basically, for same project, they change sometimes their content, their packaging, uh, and then this can change the AI forecast. And this is like 58% improvement. And one thing to tell, I mean, for some project, this is really high, but uh, there are, we have also some low engagement producers who didn't do the change and they didn't work on this kind of improvements. Uh, so this is together with that. And this is for gross case, it is 53% uh, improvement. And uh, so AI, this financial part is a black box model. There is almost like 1000 uh, input parameter, uh, parameters to the system. Uh, so for each European country, we have different models. But what we did, we took the average of uh, these models for European countries to see for this black box model, which are the drivers for the financial success. Uh, so content, p and and budgets, uh, uh, they are appearing as the most important parameters. Yeah, as you, most of you know as well, the only content, good content uh, is not good for good financial return in box office. Uh, p and and budget is very important, but here it doesn't mean, I mean, uh, with the budget important doesn't mean uh, you need more budget to have more financial success. It means the correct budgets for, for having the really high return on investments. And once the producers, they, they have added their project onto the, onto the platform, we also made a small survey to ask them what is uh, the most important instrument for them to create an impact. So this was the, during the COVID time, still we see uh, like more than 50% uh, of the projects, they were considering the box office as the most important instrument. And there's a good amount of uh, firms that, which considered the festivals as the most important instrument. That's also one reason for European films for this uh, domestic return on investment situation as for some of the producers uh, in this program as well, the, the, the box office return uh, becomes very secondary. Okay, so let's give also some practical information about the engagement of the participants in the program. Uh, we had uh, out of uh, 22 participants, we had uh, 11 participants with very high engagement. High engagement here means uh, using the tool continuously within these six months. And we had six part participants with medium engagement. Uh, that means they used uh, the tool sometime, uh, sometimes and they gave a break other times. Uh, and we had five participants with, uh, with the low engagement. These were the ones they, uh, they put the project one time, but they didn't follow up. They didn't uh, check the results, play, play with that. And in terms of the some basic tools, if you look at what uh, took, uh, what, uh, what had more engagement with the producers, you see the casting propositions and financial forecast tools, uh, they have been mostly used uh, by the audience. And uh, age suitability and interest tools, uh, they, they had the lowest engagement with the audience. And interestingly, we also saw the uh, yeah, the biggest disagreement between AI and actually also producers. And uh, also, we, uh, I want to sh talk shortly about uh, the complaints and limitations of AI with, uh, that, we, that we solved together with these 22 producers. 
One of them is ethnicity that we have already talked about. The other one is uh, data synchronization. Uh, so for example, we had recently a case, the actor has died like two weeks ago, but then AI suggested that actor as a potential cast to the film. Uh, but he, yeah, here the main challenge, we cannot synchronize the data like in very frequent manner, which means like in daily manner and then retrain the models because that would increase uh, the, both the costs of, uh, cost of the tool and also the overall uh, energy consumption. So there is no real benefit of that. Uh, but still we make this, this synchronization uh, frequent enough so that uh, it doesn't miss the, the main change in the market. And one other uh, limitation is the new talents. Uh, so new talents here, I am talking about complete new talents. Uh, let's say an actor that has never uh, acted in a feature film. For such cases, uh, AI doesn't have enough information and it doesn't provide any insights for, uh, uh, for this kind of uh, talents, which, is, uh, which is a limit, appears as a limitation of AI. And to, yeah, I'm coming to, uh, to the end of my presentation. And uh, I think one thing I should mention the overall result of uh, this program, because here the main, main idea of this program was to introduce uh, these tools to European uh, independent producers and see how they are interacting with these tools and uh, to create a value for them. And we are very happy to see that 60% of uh, these participants, they continue using AI tools uh, with us even after, uh, after this program. And 20% of uh, these participants, they have been in more skeptical mood. Uh, some of them are not sure and some of them don't have enough uh, material to, to continue to use the AI tools. And 20% of uh, participants, they think this is, uh, this is not for them. And, uh, and then this, at the start of this uh, program, uh, which we did the introduction at Marche du Film uh, last year, we said exactly this phrase, AI is not a, a magic stick, but it's a magnifier. And we again saw uh, within this program how this is uh, important in terms of the alignment of the expectations and the real benefit of AI. Uh, we saw the, the producers who used this like a magnifier, they took the real advantage. What does that mean? Uh, it means AI doesn't tell what to do. It provides insights, some possibilities, some uh, possible decision parameters, but again, then it's you who should work on this to make a decision. And we had also some cases, the producers who expected like a, like an autonomous driving that AI does everything, but for them, yeah, there was a mismatch in terms of expectation. And uh, yeah, I want to, conclude uh, my presentation for another call. So this program has been really successful that we did with 22 producers. Uh, this year, we, will, we want to introduce uh, these tools uh, to many more uh, independent producers, and we will have a program of uh, support for 100 uh, producers in four cohorts during uh, this year with the support of many uh, uh, national and local institutions. So the institutions will uh, provide the compensations uh, from specific regions uh, uh, to introduce to the AI tools from, from uh, the region. If you are interested uh, in this program, you can make your application from the link that you see on the slide. Thank you very much. That will be the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Sammy. Sounds very exciting. I'm sure that you're gonna have a lot of people applying very quickly. <laughs> um, do you already know what perhaps could be the, the, the first, the, the beginning of the next workshop that you're going to do? Uh, yeah, the program, the first cohort, uh, it will start uh, right away in uh, like first of April and actually you'll make uh, the oh. first cohort selection in the next two, three weeks. Okay, so that's that's really that's quite soon, and and it's for it's yeah. open to films from all over the world and to filmmakers from all over the globe. Yes, we, it a bit depends. I mean, uh, because for certain regions we don't have uh, yet supports, uh, both like institutional level, and sometimes we don't have uh, we don't have the AI models developed. Uh, but so it's mainly uh, Europe, uh, US, and then we will accept also some uh, Latin American countries. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much for those insights, Sammy. Um, I'm going to ask you to just stay put for a second. Um, I'd like to now invite 
two more guests to the conversation who are also actually part of this uh, group of 22 who experimented with your AI tools. They are Judith Lickneckert and Sophie Erbs. Ladies, welcome to you both. Um, I can see you now, wonderful. So just as a brief intro, I'm just going to say a few words about Judith. She is a Swiss producer and co-owner of Snake Films with a very prolific career that includes documentaries, feature films, TV, movies, and series, including Der Bestetter and commercials. She currently has two films in production, the documentary Le Nouvelle Eve with Emilia Productions and the future Die Schwarze Spinne. Welcome, Judith. And also our second guest she is a French producer, Sophie Erbs. She currently is a partner in Cinema de Facto and Gagin. She is no stranger to the film festival circuit, having produced or co-produced features that have been shown in Cannes and Berlin, among others, including Los Perros, The Harvesters, and The Load. Again, ladies, welcome to you both. Okay, so let's just get it started then. Uh, I'm dying to hear, how did it go? I mean, in general, would you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Whoever wants to take it first. Um, Judith, thumbs, thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> Judith, we get a thumbs up from Judith. <laughs> okay, great. Sophie, was that a, a thumbs up as well? Okay, wonderful. So the both of you seem to have had uh, positive experiences. Uh, we're going to get into the, the details of that in just a minute. But tell me, Sophie, was this the first time that you used AI tools in the development of a project? Yes. Yeah, I had never used anything. Um, Why did like you decide to do it? Intelligence. I was using human intelligence before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what made you join Sammy's, Sammy's workshop? I, was, I, I saw the opportunity and I was very curious to understand the way it works and if it was something that could actually bring us uh, something as well as indeed some people could see it as a threat and I was really knowing if it was really a threat or if it was on the opposite, something we could use as a weapon to keep doing what we want to, what we stand for and in, in our independent way of doing things. So you, you didn't see it as a threat initially. I mean, going into it, you weren't threatened by the idea of having this tool. No, I didn't, but I knew the argument that it could turn into a threat. And I was actually curious to actually dig into that. Okay. The arguments being quite simple that uh, by industrializing so much our proceeds and way of making films, we would end up having standard standardizations of films. Uh, and as well, that it could be a tool that could belong only to those who could afford it and therefore like they could own the power towards decision making about which film gets made or not. So that's why I was really interested to get into it to understand about that. Judith, tell me, you also put your thumbs up. Yeah. This is the first time that you experimented with AI tools. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, actually quite similar. Um, of course, I mean, if you don't know how something works, uh, then it can be seen as a, as a threat uh, quite quickly. And so I wanted to find out Therefore, uh, how does it work? Uh, what can it do? How does it see your projects? Also, um, who is it for? Who is going to use it? And what for? And in what uh, connections? So uh, I also wanted to find out um, how far does it go? What can it do? How, what is included? What sort of spectrum does it cover? Is it like uh, only for mainstream, like US big productions? Or can it be used for European art house movies as well? Um, so I wanted to find out quite a lot about uh, what range it covers and uh, who is it for and how to use it. And you were able to put any perhaps um, perceptions, preconceived ideas of, of AI to one side when you went in there? Um, yes, well, it's, it's an ongoing process because uh, um, uh, Sami and his uh, people that are keeping uh, um, developing it further and further and further and there are more and more features plopping out of uh, nowhere suddenly and it's, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's an ongoing thing and uh, I was surprised with a couple of features um, how far it really goes and what you can really uh, do with it. Um, in other respect, uh, I was uh, well, maybe not surprised, but I mean, okay, it's not going that far. The emotional stuff is a bit difficult to represent. 
Um, but anyway, it, it's, there, there are so many various analysis um, possibilities that, uh, that this is quite a lot which is, which is covered by it, really. So what surprised you? Um, well, for, for me, I mean, what I, what I used most, because I've got a couple of uh, projects analyzed which are in early development, so first draft, uh, for instance, script or even treatment, uh, I've got one in post-production, um, and uh, especially those projects which are in early development, script basis, uh, it really uh, gives us quite uh, interesting, good tools to, uh, to uh, go uh, analyzing the script, for instance, mm -hmm. to um, give you visualizations about character analysis, uh, relationships of characters, character appearances. And uh, this is quite an interesting and good help uh, a tool because it, it saves you a lot of time to creating all these sort of uh, visualizations and you have got a common ground with authors uh, to, to, to look at uh, the structure, for instance, of a script and why something might or might not work. It doesn't give you the solutions. So uh, your dramaturgical skills are absolutely necessary in order to analyze and do something with it. It's, it's not there. There is no solution there for any problem. Um, but uh, it gives you visualizations which you can really use. And um, so for me, this is one of the um, features which I used really most of the. And Sophie, what, were, what was something that surprised you and perhaps also some of the features that you used the most? I wouldn't say I was uh, surprised by any of the features that I felt were very interesting to look at, but it's they were mostly like the different steps of film producing, you know, like analyzing your script and thinking about your cast. So all of this, I was, I mean, it's something you know as a producer when you work in development and, and even later in post-production. Mm -hmm. I was particularly interested into, into seeing the financial analysis uh, for the different films, whether they were in post-production or in pre-production, uh, because for me, this was the place where I felt maybe that tool could tell me more about, okay, what can I expect? Because I was also working on new markets uh, as a producer on certain type of films I had never done before. So I was, okay, let's try to see if that tool can give me some information that can be valuable and that can help me to approach either development or post-production while, while I'm there and I do it. Um, th those were the tools I used the most, actually, the, the, the casting one and the financial analysis. Sammy, if I may, have you heard anything so far that surprised you? Uh, no, I think we see actually this is a very good example because we hear that uh, Judith is telling she's more has more interested in this uh, content part and so the cases is more casting and uh, casting and uh, financial forecast, which we see also as, as like uh, some uh, typical behaviors. Now we have many uh, producers working with us. Yeah, uh, but it's good. I mean, that's one thing we also designed the tool in a way. Uh, it provides both like all content insights and also overall packaging insights, which we see both of them uh, are uh, part of the problem on overall workflow. Mm. And is there was there um, anything? I, I think um, Judith, you you I, I want to say you mentioned something along these lines, but I'm I'm not sure. Um, something that you were like, well, okay, this is not what I expected. It did not meet my expectations, or wasn't as helpful as I imagined. Um, well, for the moment, I think, uh, as I said before, there are a couple of things in development. I think we are not there yet with all features where, where it's heading to. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we are, for instance, uh, some you mentioned that like age suitability or genre recipe, uh, especially I was also looking at, um, you know, the contents, what, what, what content is it, romance or comedy, etc. the emotional the more the emotional parts of uh, of the analysis is uh, is not quite there where you you can analyze it with uh, the human factor involved. It's 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 not a it doesn't match really. Um, it doesn't go that far at the moment. I, I think it's probably fair to say that that's one of the biggest concerns, right? Of people of creatives when when thinking about AI is this you know will the human factor go away? you know, will you lose somehow creative control because now you're using AI? Do you feel like that's a, anyone of you can take it by the way, guess. 
I, I would more think that, I mean, the main concern maybe is to know whether it's the artist going to an audience or the audience shaping the artist move. And I believe this would be what I would feel more as a threat that suddenly, you know, we all end up making films because we have a tool telling us uh, that's the way to make it to reach the audience. But I don't believe that's the case. I believe first there's gonna be creators and, and creativity and where I didn't change the content of my script depending on what the tool was telling me. I changed my approach of production. Okay. On that, but it's not the content that I decided to change. I was more trying to use that as a weapon to make my films exist more okay. with the liberty of creation that they had. It's a, you know, it's a basic principle. You cannot break the rule if you don't know it. So if you know the system and if you know somehow, okay, what are the expectations? Where can you be smart and still offer something that's going to be original, that's going to be a real proposal from you know an artistic team. And at the same time, try to reach an audience that is as wide as possible for their voice to be heard. Uh, that's more the way that I would love that tool to keep digging and to be kept being developed. And I believe it's quite important that the European film industry and the national film industry actually help shaping it to go in that direction because in my opinion, it's a very viable one. So along the lines of actually a question I was going to ask you a little later on, but you know, could how could this potentially be of the greatest help in the future? And it sounds like this is where you, <laughs> this is where your heart is. Uh, Sammy or Judith, did you have any thoughts on that? Where you think this could potentially be the greatest help in the future, AI tools for independent producers? Well, I think also, um... To, um, to to support us in uh, in respect of opening up in co-productions in, in this in this sector, uh, for me also like uh, this coming up project which I've got now, which are also uh, uh, co-productions. Um, there uh, I see more potential to to look at these features for um, well also for the casting for the production wise the financing, etc. Um, and uh, I do hope that. Uh, it's uh, this technical innovation, which it is, and which we could use, and wherever it's going to um, go from here, that's uh, the artistical innovation, the artistic vision, the artistic innovation, which might be really um, artistically a uh, hardcore art house sort of uh, points of views that this is uh, still going to be possible and not uh, uh, streamlined uh, into some sort of mainstream format so it fits the, the budget and, the, and, and this, all these uh, financial outcome aspects. Um, I, I, uh, I, for, for me, it's really important that this core of the content um, a creation uh, is uh, as open and remains as open uh, as possible. And uh, therefore, um, I quite wonder, I mean, who is going to use these tools? I mean, we can use it as producers and then have our parameters, which we are interested, et cetera, et cetera. Is this going to be uh, spread around? Is uh, are the TV broadcasters are using that or are, are the other companies using who is having which parameters set yeah. and uh, telling uh, who as we don't have we don't particularly necessarily share the same goals right so uh, where you know uh, who is going to use it for what with what sort of um, goals this sounds like a question for Sammy <laughs> I would think yeah One of the well, I mean, <laughs> yeah I think for us for example in terms of strategy I mean there are two ways of applying AI. One is really like mainstream industry, Hollywood, actually, that is where all the money uh, is, majority of the money is coming from. And for AI perspective, this is very easy uh, to apply, to develop a model. And also in terms of market is very big. Uh, so if you look at commercial, this is very interesting. And, and you can just focus on that and do uh, for us as like as Largo to all our R&D investment in that direction. But we strongly believe in uh, European in, uh, in making in general independent uh, producers. And, and we believe, I mean, we should make such tools available uh, to them as well. The main challenge for us, uh, once we go to independent productions, uh, so the movies are more difficult to understand. Uh, they are more sophisticated. The same challenge also for AI. So AI needs we should make really more R&D. To, to because I can tell, I mean, from our experience, I mean, if you put some Hollywood film in the AI and also some art house film, the confidences are changing. For Hollywood film, it's like 
perfectly confident, but once it comes a bit more, a bit experimental art house uh, film, the patterns becomes a bit hard to predict for AI, even for human, because some films, I mean, it's not clear the feeling for him, even for human uh, as well. Uh, so uh, from our side, yeah, it has been a good, it has, it requires a good R&D uh, investment as we need to localize for many countries, but we believe in uh, really European cinema, we really, it's one of our vision to provide, to make this accessible as much as possible to independent producers as well. All right, thank you for that. We're gonna go ahead because uh, looking at the time, we're gonna jump into that Q and A, um, but I just wanna hear from the producers before we go, would you use it again? Sophie. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah. Uh, thanks to Sami and the Lago team, I, I'm able to you know, keep using it for uh, some more time. And I'm really looking forward for the moment where the film I've you know, put here in development or in post-production are gonna get released. And we're gonna see, you know, the moment we can confront the figures uh, of the reality with the ones we had uh, on the machine. Yeah. The moment of truth. And you, Luke, Judith? Yeah, yeah, same here also, like uh, it's, uh, the program is still going on. So uh, we will have the chance, hopefully, if we can release our films on time, which I hope uh, to see the, the actual results. <laughs> Um, whatever COVID or how much it's going to affect it, I don't know um, yet. But anyway, to, to see as compared to the numbers which we got and also like uh, for the new ones which are in development now so that we can uh, have these broader and uh, wider sort of uh, features which are coming up now then we can uh, include them in our analysis as well. So, yeah. All right, great. Signing back up. Okay, I'm going to just, uh, I've been having a look at some of the questions we've been getting. There are some some, uh, they want to know where the data comes from, Sammy. <laughs> More than one person. Where do you get the data to feed the algorithm? There are many resources of uh, data for us. There are public data. We have some private data partners. And then we have also our own data as well. I mean, just uh, uh, to let you know, we have our own TV channel. We have the audience uh, reactions, like anonymous audience reactions to many different contents. So we really closely uh, watch uh, that as well. And the structure of data, there are many different models. We have, first of all, like, uh, like scripts, the dialogues of the films. This is all for content analysis. And then there is like video part learning for this. We use the trailers, uh, all the publicly available uh, data as well. And then metadata parts, like all the packaging of these films to see what kind of uh, talents, what kind of... Uh, numbers are creating creating what kind of results. Okay. Andre is asking, now we've touched on this already in our discussion, but he is asking, isn't there a high risk of standardization when using AI tools to create films? We already see with Netflix's algorithms, everything is the same. Who wants to take it? Well, I can start then, I mean, uh, from at this, to tell our point of view, and here, as uh, Sophie and Judith also told, at this moment, our tool uh, doesn't tell what to do I and mean, uh, what kind of content to create. So it always starts with the content, uh, the content of the producer. So, and then it gives insights about that. So, and actually, this is also a principle we put from the start, is that we won't tell I mean, it is possible as well, like Netflix, that Netflix is doing. We can really go inside AI. We see actually what are the recipes are uh, doing. We said, let's take the original content in the center and then to show some insights and how you can a bit boost further, uh, sometimes dramatically actually, how you can boost further its potential and, and even how to boost, we don't tell this part and it just gives the insights parameters. Again, the producers need to, uh, need to discover that. I have a couple of people asking if um, you could also use this for documentaries and animated films. Uh, yeah, animated, uh, all tools you can use for documentaries that are a bit, you can still use, but some features won't be available. Uh, okay. So for example, box office becomes uh, meaningless, but they get now streaming forecasts for that. Okay. Um, from the various genres, what specific titles were used as a benchmark for the AI to reference for your project? 
And uh, this is for the producers, I think. Did you use various samples per genre? Did you use this function? I didn't understand the question exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess they want, what they want to know is, um, did you use this um, benchmark? Did you use this benchmark to reference your, did you use like to compare the feature? Other films, exactly, to compare your films. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Did you use this feature? Yes, the way it works is that you enter your script or your film in post production and it gives you reference of titles of films that are comparable. And the list is quite long. So it's up to you to go and look for films that you haven't seen or that it's suggesting. So it's basically benchmarking that you would do anyway. It's just giving access to titles that maybe you would not have thought of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here, Did there you... is one thing to add, maybe. So there is also some free search. So there's like 60,000 films analyzed. Uh, you can just type the title of the film that you get same, for example, genre patterns for these uh, previous films. Then you can have one by one comparison, your film versus this, this uh, previous film. Okay, also stay on with me. Also a couple of questions on the business model. So how does it work? I mean, do you pay per project, per month, per year? Our general model is uh, subscription. Uh, so still on demand is possible, but we, I mean, we are not feeling we provide the real value because you can get one analysis, but the real value is if you really play with the parameters to see in which direction you can go maybe uh, to, to increase uh, the impact. And then, yeah, uh, they can contact us to have like a specific uh, cost for, for their uh, type of business as we have different packages. And how does Largo AI's offering compare to competitors such as Synalytic, Scriptbook and Vault AI? Uh, well, so for competitors, I mean, uh, so one difference, I think our big focus uh, in Europe uh, that we really develop uh, models specific to European countries uh, well, if I go specifically, I mean, I think for synalytic, they don't make content analysis. They make the forecasting part, script book, uh, and uh, script book is more focusing on script parts, which is in that part, we have really many similar features. Uh, uh, one thing we do differently, we make also video analysis that you can put uh, like rough cut, fine cut of your film to get some analysis also on video version. I have... Uh... Ladies, uh, my apologies. I think a lot of the questions really have to do with, uh, with the technology itself. Um, a lot of questions are coming in about this. So what data was fed to the AI to project expanded ROI? And how is allocation of PNA taken in consideration? So uh, the data, so the system doesn't predict return on investment. It predicts the revenue. Then from that, you can see what becomes the return on investments. And for this, for example, for box office, uh, for this specific country, we fed all box office results for all films that we have evaluated. And once we put a film into the, into the predictor, it gets all of its content ingredients and also all metadata together with that. Like its budget, its director, its casting uh, parameters all together. And PNA becomes uh, as an input as well, and it becomes an important it has an important relationship also overall with this uh, release pattern of the film, like the number of theaters that are released in this uh, country. I have a question too on the, uh, you mentioned this in your talk, Sammy, about the bias, the, the eth ethnicity bias, potential ethnicity bias um, in the casting. And, um, and I wondered, uh, Sophie and, and Judith, if you, did you use the casting function? For your projects, yes. Yeah. And how did it match up with what you had envisioned? Um, like I say, I mean, uh, we just checked it out uh, out of curiosity, for instance, for the one which been actually uh, been shooting, and uh, we checked what is coming up. And uh, okay, I mean, we are setting the parameters Switzerland, Germany, so it was coming up with quite a, a number of solutions, which uh, well were good possibilities, really. Um, to uh, uh, what our cast is concerned. And 
um, for two, one co-production, which would be uh, be to cover in, with Lithuania, we had a, a you know a broader um, openness towards where the actors would come, and of course, obviously, there were a lot of actors which we didn't know. It was interesting to to look at these suggestions uh, then as well. But I mean, uh, meeting up expectations. Sometimes uh, we really encountered quite uh, quite some actors which we certainly wouldn't be able to afford. Um, this was one of uh, the things, but uh, well, I should say uh, most of them were really quite appropriate to to what uh, we were doing. Okay, and uh, what was your experience, Sophie, with the casting? Yeah, it's one of the tools I I actually used the the most. Um, my experience was pretty good. Uh, first, you you can enter the the cast that you think about, and the machine is giving you like probability that uh, it fits in a way the other films that such actor has already done before. Uh, second thing, it was useful and the proposals were mostly uh, mostly good. Um, but I think the tool is still in development and that's one of the good things is that we can give feedbacks directly. For me, one of my concerns is that sometimes the, the replies were too wide and I had like many and there's also a new tool called Creative Lab that you can actually even dig deeper and you can get like really long list. I still needed something to actually narrow it down because it was a bit wide, I felt sometimes. But it's something that the team has always been very reactive into adding new features. And I believe it's one of the things that will be soon very efficient. And so far, it was just like the rest is, is helping us, human beings, take decisions, move forward with putting on the table, okay, these are the different things we have. And in the end, we are the one making the decision and confronting different sources of information. And it's definitely one source of information that we, we did take in consideration. Thank you. Along those lines, Cordell Green um, is asking Sammy where you got the data, what's the AI use for character analysis and casting recommendations and how you can ensure that the algorithm was not biased. Well, the data is coming, uh, I mean, we don't have a specific actor data, but we learn for these actors actually create our own DNAs of these actors. And the way it comes, it's from their previous films. So we have uh, their previous films that have been analyzed. And then we see how they have been, uh, what kind of attributes are repeating for these actors in positive association and what are what attributes are appearing as a negative association. So this way it creates a DNA of, uh, of the actor. Just wanting to note that here. So it shows these, uh, these matching scores for these actors. Of course, that uh, I mean, if the score is low, that doesn't mean the actor is very bad for this character, but it shows it's a very risky choice. And sometimes you can take these risky choices. Uh, but if you have really a, some financial targets, uh, I mean, we can tell not to take this risky choice because we have proven uh, like in many cases. So the firms who had uh, less financial success, we saw in average, their, this actor match rates, they were significantly lower than successful firms. And then, yeah, we are very sure about that. But yeah, it's for an artistic, uh, decision and then the, the return is not so important then, then yeah then you don't care these machines. Mm -hmm. um, Nurkan Gusel is asking, is commenting first, women's speeches are rare in blockbuster movies even in many Oscar winning film projects. Will it help us get rid of the masculine language in cinema? Uh, we'll have to get out masculine language? To or? get rid of the masculine. To get rid of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Language I think cinema. the thing, one powerful thing with AI, we can make the change so fast uh, because I mean like ethnicity thing. For example, we made a study. This was for US, not Europe. Uh, as US, there is uh, the casting variation is uh, more stronger uh, than Europe. We checked if uh, for some studio films, we saw if they were, while they were doing their casting, they were uh, considering AI suggestions they had uh, three times more chances of casting black actors, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so it shows you yeah, once you uh, remove certain data from AI, so easily you remove this uh, bias uh, from the system. So for the 
masculine language as well here we should if we can define that in a good way so we can take this out from the ai actually while people are using these tools it of course they still make the decision but at least they can see different potential different recipes uh, without uh, having this specific uh, method mm -hmm. awesome i've just had a question and it has jumped away from my <laughs> from the q a um, but about basically about what kind of budgets uh, this tool is good for also small smaller films so budgets under a million euro uh, well if it's a short film we don't recommend the tool uh, directly it's not uh, because the, it, the ai has learned mostly with uh, the data for feature films and it has been trained uh, for that for feature films i mean there are quite a bit 80 percent of the tools are not about financial forecasts. So like in documentary case as well, in many cases they are lower budget, but still you get a lot of insights related to your uh, content and, uh, and also casting all, all these elements. Uh, and once it goes too low from below 1 million budgets, the financial forecast becomes less confident. So then yeah, we recommend, I mean, not to too much uh, consider financial forecast uh, if the budget I mean, especially if it's lower than uh, like 400,000 half a uh, million. It, it changes country to country because it depends on if we have the data from these type of films before. And in many cases for very low budget films, we don't have enough financial result data and then AI cannot learn about that. That is the main problem. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. Unfortunately, if, they, if we weren't able to get to their questions, Sammy, can they follow up perhaps afterwards? Yeah, please reach to us. Uh, I mean, if you send uh, email to info at largofilms.ch, uh, so we will be able to come back to you. Uh, our team will come back to you to answer your question. Okay, wonderful. All right, so Judith, Sophie, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing your experience in the Largo AI workshop. Um, I. I hope I can follow up with you in some way <laughs> to find out if in fact everything worked out in the end and how and how successful you were with your projects. Meanwhile, I do wish you the very best. Thanks to all of you that joined us today. Very exciting to know so many of you were out there listening. And hey, get out there and make some good movies. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.